In the previous video, we discussed how to apply finite difference methods to the Poisson equation. And then we summarize at the end of the video, iterative methods versus direct methods, pros and cons, general features of each. In this video, I'm just going to very quickly address two direct methods that are very popular and very efficient when they apply. I'm not going to go through the details. I'm just going to mention them and give you some remarks about them. And then in the next video, we'll start looking at iterative techniques that are much more scalable and much more generally applicable to these elliptic equations that we're interested in solving. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Fourier transform method and cyclic reduction. So let me rewrite our finite difference equation. So 5.3 here is the same finite difference equation we had in the previous video for the Poisson equation. So we start with a Poisson equation, which is partial squared u partial x squared plus partial squared u partial y squared is equal to some known function f of x, y on the right hand side. We use second order accurate central difference approximations for the two second derivatives. And then we put all the unknowns on the left and all the knowns on the right to give us our finite difference equation as you see here. The only difference you'll see in this form versus the previous form, I've denoted the square of the delta x over delta y as delta bar, just to simplify things slightly here. But once again, we have our one, two, three, four, five unknowns on the left-hand side that corresponds to our five-point finite difference stencil, and then all the knowns, which is the fij, on the right-hand side. Remember, we multiply through by delta x squared in order for all of the coefficients on the left-hand side to be order one. Now in a direct method, so you can think of Gauss elimination or LUD composition, in a direct method, we want to solve the system of equations a, u, is equal to, say, d, the right-hand side vector. The problem you'll notice here is we have two indices, i's and j. What we need, the unknown vector u, is to have just one vector with one index. Now we have two, so we need to convert this into a problem that's equivalent, but only has one index. So what I'm going to show you is simply accounting. It doesn't change anything about the problem. It doesn't change anything about the finite differencing techniques that we're using no change to discretization errors and so forth. All I'm doing is accounting for how we number the points in the domain in a different way with one index instead of two. So this is what we had last time with i is equal to one being the left boundary, then two and then three, and then capital I plus one being the right boundary. J is equal to one is the lower, then two, three, four, five, six. In this case, I have seven and seven is capital J plus one, that's the upper boundary. So every point in the grid where these grid lines intersect has an I and a J. So this point right here is I is equal to three and J is equal to three. This point is I is equal to three, J is equal to five. All we're gonna do is map these to a single index. This is not unique, there's different ways to do this, this is the way I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna start in the lower left-hand corner and I'm gonna call that n is equal to one. And then I'm gonna go up. I could go to the right, but I'm gonna go up. So this is n is equal to one, then this is n is equal to two, three, four, five, six, seven. When I get to the top, I drop back down on the next column. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Back down here, so that's 15. I just keep numbering the points in the grid in this fashion. Then I get to the last point, is the upper right hand corner. So in that way, every point has an ij address, so to speak, as well as an n address. The relationship between them is simply n is equal to the quantity i minus one times capital J plus one plus j. And if you look back at the mapping I just showed you in that plot, you can see that this is the case. Now the i goes from one to capital I plus one, the j goes from one to capital J plus one in our two-dimensional grid, but now n in a single index goes from one to capital I plus one times capital J plus one. So it's the same number of total points, they're just indexed differently in terms of n. One way to show this is using the finite difference stencil. So here's the five-point finite difference stencil that we had in the previous video. So this is using second order accurate central difference approximations to the second order derivatives. We have our generic ij point. We have a point to the right, i plus one j, point to the left, i minus one j, point below ij minus one, and a point above ij plus one. Now, those same five points are gonna be mapped as follows. 
the ij point is now the nth point. The point below is n minus 1. The point above is n plus 1, because we're going from bottom to top. The point to the left, though, is now n minus capital J plus 1. So we have to shift over capital J plus 1 to pick up this point. And then the point to the right is n plus capital J plus 1. So again, we're shifting all the way over by capital J plus 1 to pick up this point. So again, same find a different stencil, just a different accounting of the locations of the points within the grid. So let's rewrite our finite difference equation now in terms of n instead of i and j. And I'm going to make one other simplification. This is not necessary, but just to make our equations a little bit simpler, I'm going to set delta x equal to delta y and just call that delta. And in that case, then the delta bar, which remember is the square of delta x over delta y, that'll just be 1 because delta x and delta y are the same. So that just simplifies our finite difference equation just for the sake of showing you what the overall matrix problem looks like. So I still have my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 unknowns, but now all the coefficients are 1 except for the center point, the un point, is now minus 4. And then delta squared times the right-hand side, f sub n. Again, n goes from 1 to capital I plus 1 times capital J plus 1. So the way this is going to look, if you write the whole thing out, if you apply this equation at every value of n, you're going to get this many equations for this many unknowns. The unknowns will be all the u's, u1 through u capital I plus 1 times capital J plus 1. So you can see now we have our solution vector u is now all of those points, all the grid values, all the approximate values of u at each grid point, but now with just one index as we would like to express it as a vector. The coefficient matrix then has these ones and minus four, but in a very special, very particular pattern. Let's look at what that is. This is our coefficient matrix A for the entire system of equations, but it's written in a block form. So each of these is its own little submatrix. The zeros are little submatrices that are all zeros. The i's are the identity matrix, so it's a submatrix of a particular size. I'll, I'll talk about the size in a moment. And it's just identity matrix. One's down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And then the d's are block matrices that are on the diagonal. Now let's think about what those look like. Let's start with the d. So we have a un, a un minus one, and a un plus one. So we're going to have three non-zero elements right in a row n minus 1, n, and n plus 1. The middle one is going to be minus 4, and the off diagonals will be 1's. So that gives us our d. Minus 4 is down the main diagonal, 1's on the upper, 1's on the lower diagonal. These d blocks that go down the main diagonal of the block matrix have zeros here and here, and they're tridiagonal along the upper, main, and lower diagonals. Then the i's, the identity matrices, those pick up these coefficients, the one coefficients, for these two terms. But you'll notice they're offset by capital J plus 1 below and above. So that's where these identity matrices come in. So if you were to write out this entire A matrix, you'd have minus 4's down the diagonal, 1's down the upper, 1's down the lower diagonal, then there would be a whole bunch of zeros above and below, and then another set of ones. We call those fringes. So that's what the matrix would look like. Here it is in block form. Now we say this is block tridiagonal because in block form we only have the main, the upper, and the lower diagonals that are non-zero. Everything else is a zero. So it's not tridiagonal, but it's block tridiagonal. In a block sense, it's tridiagonal. Now the sizes of the blocks. There are capital I plus one blocks in both directions. This is a square matrix. And each block is capital J plus 1 by capital J plus 1. So all we've done is convert our finite difference equation that was written in a two-dimensional way, now written in a 1D way. So now we have a big system of linear algebraic equations with capital I plus 1 times capital J plus 1 unknowns. But it is a big system of equations, AU equals D. So we can use any method we want. We could use Gauss elimination, LU decomposition, those are direct methods. 
that are generally used for full dense systems, so lots of non-zero elements, or if it is sparse and banded, then we can use techniques that are designed specifically for the structure or the sparsity of the matrix problem that we're trying to solve. So we already solved for the tridiagonal matrix. It's banded and sparse, and we could use the Thomas algorithm very efficiently. And now in this case, we can use what's called fast Fourier transform, or FFTs, and or cyclic reduction. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of these because we want to move on to the iterative techniques that are more scalable and useful in parallel computers. But I want to make you aware of these techniques, of their existence, and some of the properties of them. So the first direct method I'll mention is the Fourier transform method. So Fourier transforms, it's an analytical technique, like Laplace transforms, can be used in a number of different ways. It's used for signal processing, image processing, and so forth. There is a continuous version, a discrete version. Here we use the discrete version based on, as I said, FFTs, fast Fourier transforms. So here you go, photographic memory, you can zip through those. So let me just make a few remarks about where this is useful and the limitations. So in practice, so in other words, when we actually use this, this discrete Fourier transform that's required, and we also have to do an inverse, is done using FFTs, fast Fourier transform. This is a very specific technique. It's highly optimized for speed and efficiency. And you'll find it in a number of books. Numerical Recipes has a great treatment of FFTs. It's generally built into most libraries and so forth, so it's easy to access these FFTs. The method itself can only be used in the context that we're talking about to solve partial differential equations if it has constant coefficients. So constant coefficients in the partial differential equation itself. So in the directions where you do the FFTs, you need constant coefficients. So that's a big limitation. Not all of our equations have constant coefficients. The Poisson equation or Poisson equation do, but that's not always the case. One thing you should notice is that Fourier transform methods, so FFTs, are applied to the difference equation, not the differential equation. So I've mentioned spectral methods before. Spectral methods are where we use eigenfunction expansions to solve differential equations, but spectral methods are applied directly to the differential equation, whereas here, FFTs are applied to the discrete difference equation, not the differential equation. So these are not spectral methods. There's some overlap in terminology, and they look somewhat similar in some ways, but they are very different approaches. As I mentioned before, these are very commonly used in analysis of image and signal processing, very standard techniques. The second direct method is cyclic reduction. What this does is it takes our two-dimensional problem and turns it into, through this recursive cyclic reduction technique, into the solution of a whole bunch of tridiagonal systems of equations. Now, we love tridiagonal systems of equations because we can solve them efficiently using the Thomas algorithm. So this is a very efficient technique. It's very elegant. turns a two-dimensional problem into a series of 1D tridiagonal problems. Again, here's all the details. You can look in the book or do screenshots if you like. Let me again make some comments. The number of grid points in the direction in which you do the cyclic reduction will be an integer power of 2. You'll see numbers like 64, 128, 512. And that's because of the way the cyclic reduction is done in the recursive fashion. You need an integer power of 2 grid lines in order to do that. The speed of these FFTs and cyclic reduction approaches to solving differential equations are comparable. They're not the same. FFTs are actually a little bit faster than cyclic reduction. We actually call them fast Poisson solvers. So when you see that term, fast Poisson solvers, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about FFT cyclic reduction, direct methods for solving the Poisson equation. So the reason why we have cyclic reduction is because you can apply it to a slightly more general set of equations where you have variable coefficients. So remember, FFTs requires constant coefficients. Variable coefficients can be treated using cyclic reduction. So one thing you can do, for example, it's not always the case, but if you had constant coefficients in one direction, variable coefficients in another, you could do FFTs and cyclic reduction in the corresponding directions to get the maximum speed. So if you can do Fourier, great. If you can't, you could do cyclic reduction or a combination of the two, if possible. The overall number of operations, which gives us an indication of the speed and how it scales with the size of the problem, is order n log n. n here is the number of unknowns. So it's capital I plus 1 times j plus 1, or i times j, depending on the boundary conditions. 
n log n is between order n and order n squared. So remember, we love order n because that's linear scaling. If it's n log n, that's between these. So if you want to see that, just plot it. So you can have a linear order n, parabolic order n squared, and you'll see that order n log n is between those. And that's what these fast Poisson solvers, they're order n log n. So they are very efficient and very fast, but they don't scale to really large systems. They take quite a bit of memory and they are limited to linear equations with either constant or variable coefficients. We cannot extend them to nonlinear equations. There is a library of Fortran subroutines called FishPack that was developed back in the 1970s. It's been around for many years, been beat on and improved and optimized over the years. And there's one function in, in particular, block try, which is an excellent implementation of the FFT cyclic reduction approach. I'd encourage you to just take a look at it. It's a very complex algorithm, very complex code. I've looked at it to try to see if it's parallelizable, and it essentially is not. I've added the qualifier not easily, but as far as I can tell, it's not parallelizable at all. But if you want a really good, robust, solid, efficient, direct solver for separable elliptic equations with constant or variable coefficients, you can't do any better than block try.